Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I don't usually rate such a flowery introduction. Only the Irish can put on a show like that. But I am very, very happy to be with you. And lest I forget it, the most important thing I'm going to say to you tonight is that I love you. I came all the way down to you to tell you I love you, <clears throat> and I do. And I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love its people better than anything in the world. It's been my happy privilege now to live almost 35 years <clears throat> without the necessity to take a drink or a sedating or tranquilizing pill of any kind. If I get through until the middle of January, I'll get me a cake with 35 candles on. We have an old boy at home that talks a little faster than I can listen. And he says, that might not impress you a damn bit, <clears throat> but it impresses the hell out of me, and it does. For a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot, that ain't bad. I, uh... I drank for about uh, 28 years, I guess. I had what I called 15 years of good drinking. And I thought it was 15 years of good drinking. Until I'd been around a while. And then I decided that it was 15 years of good drinking when you compared it with the last 12. <laughs> <laughs> so, in sitting here now, I can't, uh, I can't go over the whole period of my drinking time and find one occasion in the whole 28 years when I could honestly say that alcohol had added to my life. I can't find one occasion. So, maybe that's helped me to be comfortable with you, because I have no nostalgic memories at all, none. I think I got here, and the only possible way that I could have gotten here. Because, you see, I was not able to admit defeat in my entire life, <clears throat> even before I ever had a drink. I had a brother. He's three and a half years older than I and three and a half years stronger. And uh, he could beat the hell out of me which he did for 20 years straight. We had one fight that lasted 20 years on the installment plan. <laughs> he, and he could always whip me. But he couldn't make me believe it. So I left home at 20, thinking I could whip him. 
<laughs> so I didn't learn very fast. And when I uh, got in trouble with the bottle, <clears throat> I had to win that battle too. So I became a periodic. About 12 years, I guess, before I came to the program. Because I had to win. And you can't win when you're down on your back, you know. You have to get well enough to get back in the ring for the next round. So I became a periodic, and for the last dozen years I drank. I was a periodic. And, of course, I was as dry as I am tonight between every two drunks for a dozen years. And I could look at my record with physically dry eyes <clears throat> right up until my last drunk and uh, convinced myself every time that I'd learned my lesson, the next time it's going to be different. And of course it was, it was worse, just like it had always been. And another thing that I can't really explain away to myself is up until my last drunk, it was never my fault that I drank. Now this, this, this gets me. I can understand why a, an habitual drinker would be able to delude himself, you know, that it wasn't his fault. Because a daily habitual drinker never gets well enough to get sick. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> but to be cold stone dry, I'm not saying sober. I'm saying dry. And to look at this situation, I can't understand how I could live for that long I never have one drunk that was my fault. It seems to me like I'd have thought up one of them that had been my fault by accident. <laughs> if nothing else. <clears throat> but I had to go to the last one. And the last trip out, I came to see that if the default, it's mine. And I've never had to drink anymore. If there be fault, it's mine. If I had more time than I do, I'd tell you why I don't think there's fault. But I haven't had much time. <clears throat> I want to tell you a little about the last trip out and a little about what's happened so that we can give the Alcazan people a little time to talk. <laughs> I was supposed to talk 35 minutes to the hospital this afternoon, and I only talked an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> so tonight, if you stick around, I might get you about two hours and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll tell you a little about the last one. <clears throat> My last outing started the... Friday before Christmas, 1945. I went down to the office this before the holidays, and I had a little notation to see the boss. And uh, I knew why it was there. But he said, see the boss, and I had to go in to see him, and I did. And I got in there knowing why, why he'd called me in, he was going to can me. Because, you see, I knew I had it coming. But he didn't. He started talking, which was a good sign. And he said, Charlie, I was Charlie in business. He says, I think that uh, I uh, understand why you're having so much trouble. 
Now, you see, he was a non-alcoholic. And he had it all figured out. He says, you've had a lot of trouble this year, and I think I know the reason for it. He says, I think it's because of the pressure you're under. Now, says he, I'm going to take a little pressure off of you. And maybe next year you won't have so much pressure. And you won't have so much trouble. And so instead of shooting me, as he had every right to do, he gave me $3,000 for a Christmas present. On the Friday before Christmas, 1945, to take the pressure off of me. <laughs> Now, if you don't think he took the pressure off of me, you're nuts. <laughs> There's one thing that's worse for an alcoholic than bad fortune, and that's good fortune. <laughs> <clears throat> so I got drunk on the way home. Now, this is impossible, too, because I was a periodic, and periodics don't get drunk on the way home. <clears throat> periodics taper on. They never taper off. We have a regular routine. We drink till we can't get it down, can't get it up, can't live, and can't die. And then we knock it off. <clears throat> and in my day, when you knocked it off, you died, then you could get well. Because there weren't any places like you people know about where a drunk could go in those days. There wasn't a hospital in California that would take a drunk. A doctor couldn't even admit you for alcoholism. He had to call it something else. So, the way we had to sober up was to die that we could get well. And that's what we did. And, uh, as soon as we'd start getting a little bit better, we'd uh, get concerned about our diet, try to get a little uh, strength back, and then we would look at our last caper and uh, analyze it, and we would see where we made our mistakes. And we decide not to do it that way anymore. <laughs> and we, when we got everything in its place and a place for everything, we'd start sampling. And we'd sample our way right on back to bed. <laughs> but not in a hurry. It usually took me from 30 to 60 days to get off my feet. After the first slug after a dry spell. And my last time, I got drunk on the way home. <clears throat> I remember nothing from uh, the Friday before Christmas until after the middle of January, 1946. Now, if I could even remember of drinking, I am quite sure that I could figure out a way to take credit for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I think I could. But I can't remember of even taking a drink. I can't remember of any part of that thing, even the first drink. I can't remember. I came to a little after the middle of January <clears throat> with the clearest head I've ever known in my entire lifetime. Everything between me and me had burned out. All excuses were gone. And all the I wants were gone. And I uh, could see myself as I was. With nothing between me and me. I knew that I'd lost the battle of life. I didn't know why, because I knew nothing of alcoholism. I knew drunk tanks and I knew DTs and alcoholic convulsions 
but I didn't know anything of alcoholism. So, <clears throat> I knew that I had lost the battle of life, but I didn't know why. And I accepted it. And it was the first time in my life that I had ever admitted defeat. I knew why my good wife was divorcing me after 20 years. And I might say quickly, without cause. <laughs> Hadn't I given it 20 of the best years of my life? <laughs> but I knew why she was divorcing me. And I knew that she should have done it 10 years before. I knew why our kids wouldn't come home when I was around. And I knew why this same boss had sent word to the house. That if I ever stepped foot in the plant again, he's going to throw me through the window. And the window to which he referred was play glass. It don't open. <clears throat> I accepted the fact that morning that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone. And that I was not entitled to have it back. I'm going to say that again because this is what my life has been built on for 35 years. I accepted the fact totally and completely that everything dear to me in life was gone and should be gone. And I was not entitled to have it back. <clears throat> and it suddenly became very necessary for me to be sold to the diet, <clears throat> which was eminent for one reason and one reason only. I had to use what time I had left to rub out as much of the record as it could before I kicked off. <clears throat> I accepted death, and that wasn't bad. I mean, I, it was all right with me. Because I had come that close to dying the next to the last time out. That particular occasion, I'd gone to the kitchen for a glass of buttermilk, which was my tonic, in a withdrawal period. Miss C. and Richard were sitting in the living room. They heard me let out a beller and heard me at the floor. And they came running out thinking they'd find me in an alcoholic convulsion, which was my want. But I wasn't convulsing. I was just lying there on the kitchen floor as peaceful as anybody ever saw. I wasn't doing nothing. They tell me I was a peculiar color. I was blue. <laughs> and they couldn't wake me up. And they called for the oxygen squad at Beverly Hills Stephen Hospital. See if they'd send down a squad and see what they could do about me. Now, seriously, this is just sick of hell out. My wife and my kids had been praying for me to die for at least five years. <laughs> and they come out in the kitchen and find me dead and call the oxygen squad. <laughs> that just blows my gourd. <laughs> well... <clears throat> I have reason to believe they brought me two. <laughs> There's a young doctor with him, and I remember his counsel when I came to. He said to me, he said he, right straight at me, he says, to all intents and purposes, you were dead. He says, we've had a hell of a time bringing you two. And it's our opinion that nobody will ever bring you to again under these circumstances. And then he gave me the finest piece of counsel I will ever hear. He looked me right in the eye and he said, if I were you, I wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> and now I want to pass that on. If I were you, I wouldn't do that anymore. But I did it again. And the last time was much worse than the, the next to the last time. So I knew I was going to die. I didn't care. But I didn't want to die with the record. You see, I never got to the place in all my drinking career that I didn't love my wife and my kids. 
I always loved it. They always knew I didn't. Mrs. C. told me I don't think less than 500 times. <clears throat> Chuck, if you loved us, you wouldn't do these things. If you loved us, you wouldn't do these things. And how could I tell her it was because I loved them that I did? Now, you can't sell a bill of goods like that. But it's true. You see, I could look at my wife and my kids between drunks with physically dry eyes. And I knew I was crucified. And I wanted to take him in my arms. Say, look, I love you. I'll never do this again, so help me God. But I couldn't. Why? Because he'd already done it. And I knew I was going to do it again. Because I didn't know how not to do it again. So I couldn't tell it. My recourse in those days... My bed was about that far from hers. Might have been, well have been in Siberia. <clears throat> but it was not. And I used to lie there until I could tell by her breathing that she was asleep. Then I'd cry me up a river. Because I didn't want to be like that. And I didn't know how. Not to be like that. So, <clears throat> when uh, I was at Cantu when that last trip out. And had looked at me and had accepted what had happened to me. I remembered that Mrs. C. had found Jack Alexander's article in the Post, March 1st, issue 1941, about five years before. <coughs> and she had left it. Opened at the right page on the left arm of the chair I sit in right now. Hoping that I would read it when I came in, if I came in. And evidently I did. But I only remembered that morning two things about it. I remembered that drunks helped drunks and didn't drink. And they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. Because you see, I was drunk on a reddit. But I remember those two things. And I said to myself, if I ever live to get out of this bed, I'll find a aid. <clears throat> and immediately the curtain dropped. And I was sickened to death, drunk and insane. I had a lot of dying to do. But from the moment of commitment until right now, I have never had a sedating or tranquilizing pill or a drink of alcoholic beverage of any kind. And furthermore, I have never had a conscious desire for one. And I say this knowing that about half of you in the audience will say you're a damn liar. Because I've been called that many times in an open meeting. Because so many of our people who became become fine members of our society have a lot of white knuckle stuff to go through. Keep from drinking. But I never had a conscious desire for a drink since that morning. And I'm so delighted that that's the way it is. Because I'm certain in my case, had I had a conscious desire, I'd have gotten drunk. Because I always did. 
And so I feel that I'm extremely fortunate that I've never had one conscious desire for drink since that morning. And when I got well enough, I started looking for Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know where to find it. My keen alcoholic mind told me that it would not be in the phone book. You were anonymous, weren't you? <clears throat> they don't anonymous in the phone book. <clears throat> and knowing you weren't there, I never looked. Which is the story of my life. <laughs> I knew so damn much that it wasn't true, I couldn't learn anything that was. <clears throat> so I had to start calling people and asking them if they knew anybody that knew anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got a hold of a doctor in Beverly Hills who gave me the name of a member of our society and his telephone number. And I called him up. We talked a little while and he said, uh, have you had a drink today? And I said, no. But he said, don't take one. I have to work tonight. He was a motion picture man. He said, I have to work tonight, so I can't take you to meet tonight. But maybe tomorrow night I won't have to work, so call me tomorrow. So I called him tomorrow. We talked a little bit, and he said, have you had a drink today? I said, no. He said, don't take one. I'm still working. Call me tomorrow. So I called him again tomorrow. And we just got started going. I says, I know you're still working. And he says, yes. I says, you don't have to take me to meet him. Where's there a meeting that I can go to? I'll go into my own power. And he told me. <clears throat> and I determined to go. It wasn't more than ten minutes from my house. And so I felt pretty good about it until about 10, 15 minutes before time to go. And then I did the unforgivable thing. I started to think. <laughs> I have one piece of unfinished business in my life starting now. Before I kick off, I want to make every group in the United States and Canada and pick up all the think, think, think signs <laughs> and have a bonfire. That's what got us here, thinking. So, I got thinking. And I thought, my look, son, You've lived in Beverly Hills a long time. And it just might not be advantageous for you to be seen with this bunch of drunks. It might be bad for your reputation. Now you have no idea how funny that is. Because in my last ten years, I spent almost as much time in the Beverly Hills Jail as a jailer. <laughs> and here I am concerned about being seen with people who were doing something about their problem. And I bothered myself with that a little bit, and then I decided to go anyway. But I decided to disguise myself a little. So I wouldn't be immediately recognizable. And I did. And it came time to go, and I went. And it was a big hall. It was a bed of foreign horse hall. And the back door of the thing was open. And there might have been 35, there might have been 40 people standing in the middle of the room. All of them talking, and nobody listened. And it's been that way ever since. <laughs> I stood there and the daughter looked at him for a while and they didn't look like me. 
And they weren't dressed like me, and they most certainly weren't talking like me. Because it was all happy talk. You couldn't hear a word. But it was all happy talk. And again, my keen alcoholic mind played a trick on me. Said, look, they've given you the wrong night. These, this is the night that the veterans and their wives are here for a party. And you're going to have to leave and come back the night the drunks are here. At long last, I'd come. That was the wrong night. And I turned to leave. Now here in the next minute is what I believe to be the very essence of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The reason that it works. Somebody in the middle of that room had been watching me. And when I turned to leave, he came running over to the door. And he called after me. He says, Mister, were you looking for somebody? And I said, No, sir. But he says, What were you looking for then? And thinking he was a veteran, I said, Well, if it would interest you, sir, I was looking for sobriety. And everything about that man changed just like that. He lit up all over. His whole being changed. And it was obvious that he was glad I was there. Now, I'd never seen the man before in my life. And he was so glad I was there that he lit up and my own flesh and blood wouldn't spit on him. And I was hooked before he ever opened his mouth again. And when he did, this is what he said. Well, take off your hat and coat, son. You're in the right place. And he took me and rocked me to sleep. Now, I have thought of this a few thousand times in the last 35 years. And I've looked at it as honestly as I know how. And I think that if he hadn't come over to that door, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be any place where three men assembled. But he came to the door. He was the only one. Now, maybe somebody else would have come if he hadn't. But he was the only one that came to the door. And he took me in the rock his shoe. Now, the very first night, he told me a few pertinent facts that I shall never forget. And incidentally, I remember them better than I remember last night's meeting. And it's almost 35 years ago. The very first thing that he told me was if you're an alcoholic, one drink's too many and a thousand aren't enough. It's the first drink that's killed you. I'd never heard that in my life. And I'd never thought of it, about it. Never thought that at all. I thought it was the last gallon. Not the first drink. I was trying to figure out a way to cut it off before the trouble started. You know? And the very first thing he told me, he says, it's the first drink that's killing you. One drink's too many in a thousand on left. And I played with it a little bit and bought it. And I've still got it. The second thing he told me is passion. He says, today is the day we don't drink. Isn't that awful? Today's the day we don't drink. If he'd have told me, look, you've got to be sober 35 years, I'd have dropped dead. If he'd have told me 35 days, I'd have dropped dead. But he didn't. He says, today's the day we don't drink. Now, if a day's too long, how about an hour? Can you live an hour without drink? Make that the length of your life and then do it again. But don't drink today. He says, regardless of how long you live in Alcoholics Anonymous, never expand that time more than 24 hours. And I played with that a little while and bought it. And I've still got it. 
This is the second greatest lesson I've ever learned in my entire lifetime. Second greatest lesson I've ever learned. This is my day. I have no past. I want no future. Did it ever occur to you that the past is nothing in the world but guilt? And the future is nothing in the world but fear? When you live today, you need to have the guilt or the fear. You have today. It's all right right now. You know? So, second greatest lesson I've ever learned. And I remember it. After I'd been at Alcoholics Anonymous for a little while, I got to thinking that we had... Alcoholics Anonymous had invented the 24-hour way of life. And in our country, we say the Lord's Prayer. Close the meeting. And uh, here I'm going along thinking we'd advantage this deal, and after a while I, it occurred to me that somebody a couple of thousand years ago must have known something about this 24-hour way of life. Because right there in that little prayer, it says someplace, Give us this day our daily bread. And it don't say a word about two crusts to wake up on tomorrow morning. <clears throat> Not a word. Second greatest lesson I've ever learned. The third thing you told me was stay close to us. Said you. There's more wisdom in this room about your problem and its answer than in any other room on the face of the earth, except in another room just like this, where Alcoholics Anonymous members are meeting. So stay close to us. Get into as many, many meetings as you can. And I bought that, and I still got it. I have attended more nearly than five more nearly five than four meetings a week for 35 years. And I've never attended one too many. You might say, how do you know? The answer is very, very simple. This is the only easy life I have ever known. The only good life that has ever been mine in my entire lifetime. And I'm not about to change or winning for me. And the next thing you told me is why I can't drink like other people. Now, this is the only bit of intellectual knowledge that we need when we get here, I think. But it is nice to know why some people can drink well and we can't. I think it's a good thing to know. And you told me the first night. You told me that this thing I was up against was a twofold disease. An allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. An allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. The allergy of the body meaning simply this, that for some reason unknown to anybody, and I say this without fear of successful contradiction. And somebody told me there were 500 doctors here to this deal. I don't believe it. But... <laughs> 500 doctors. I can see two or three. Anyhow, nobody knows why my body can't successfully end up. Ain't nobody. But it can. And there's no way to make it over so it can. So, you told me that the allergy of the body, you can do nothing about but accept it. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Nothing you can do about the body. 
But we have a program here that will make it unnecessary for you to drink the first drink. Well, apply it to yourself. And that's what our program's all about. To make it unnecessary for us to take the first drink. Now, I hadn't heard it in these words. But I got to you people knowing that I could not successfully drink whiskey. And I got to you knowing that I could not successfully keep from drinking whiskey. And so this piece of information is invaluable to me. And I still believe it the same way it is. I remember a long time ago in this old town against my time. Check it off, will you? I remember many, many years ago, Dr. Jelnick came to the coast, and they had a symposium on alcoholism. UCA, UCLA. And uh, Dr. Jelnick did a lot of talking. And amongst other things, he told us that the term he used about an allergy of the body was not really medically correct. That it wasn't an allergy of the body. That it took <laughs> golden rods or something to make an allergy, you know. And uh, so that was a misnomer. And so I waited for him, and after the thing was over, I, I followed him. And I said, Doctor, I want you to tell me why this isn't knowledge. And he went into it beautifully. About 30, 40 minutes. When he got through, I said, Doctor, you know what you've just done? <laughs> you've just convinced me to my toenails that this is knowledge of the body. <laughs> and I still believe it. <clears throat> Don't make any difference. I don't care. <clears throat> but the thing is that there's nothing we can do about the physical part of the disease. So we apply the principle of the program to rid ourselves of the mental obsession to take that first drink. Now, <clears throat> I believe that there is only one reason that I'm not drunk right now. Just one. There's not two, there's just one. Just one reason that I'm not drunk right now. And that is that I have the thing I was looking for in the bottle. I've got it. Now, what is the thing? It's the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with myself. And having the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me, I haven't the slightest difficulty living with you. No, not the slightest. <clears throat> There's nothing in a bottle, a needle, pill, pot, or acid that can do anything for me but tear me down. And so there's no necessity to think it. I don't need it because I've got the thing I was looking for. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I have a lot of fun with lots of the, the authorities in the field of alcoholism. Because I love them, and I can fight with them. Good. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't say anything. But I love them. And many of the experts think that alcoholism is caused by alcohol. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of experts think that alcoholism is caused by alcohol. I don't think so. I don't think so, because if 
if alcohol caused alcoholism, not drinking would cause sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> and not drinking don't cause sobriety. Witness the fact that I was as dry as am night tonight between every two drunks for a dozen years. And I always got drunk again. So alcoholism is a living problem. And we have to have a living answer. And this is the great miraculous stroke of genius that came out of the early days of our great program of Alcohol's Known. It was my happy privilege to know everybody that was really uh, in the early days of our program. All of them I knew personally except Dr. Silkwood. And I freaked myself around for years by not making it my business to know him while he was around. Because he was around a long time after I got here. But I never got to meet him. But all the rest of them I knew. Many of them very well indeed. <clears throat> and Bill himself had told me on a number of occasions because he spent a lot of time in my house. And I spent a lot of time in his for a number of years, 20 years before he left. And he said that when he sat down to write the fifth chapter, uh, in the first place, it wasn't altogether an altruistic motivation. Of course, they did want to get sober and stay sober. That's true. But they wanted to eat, too. And they were starving to death. And they had an idea that they might get them, get them a little bit of dough so they could get some potatoes and gravy. They were going to write a book. And they were going to make a lot of money out of this book. Now, I'm not condemning them. But, uh, when you're hungry, uh, it's not hard to think about writing a book or maybe even driving a spike. I don't know. But uh, they needed some dough. And Bill sat down to write the book, write the fifth chapter. And he said he was feeling totally inadequate. Totally inadequate. He just didn't feel like anything. And he sat down and started writing. And in 20 minutes, he had 12 steps. And he looked at him and he says, my God, look, 12 steps. Up until that time, five, six or seven was the most steps they'd had in the program. And they'd come from the Oxford movement, mainly, and he had 12 steps. And he looked at him and he says, this is, this is good. He says, 12 months in a year, 12 disciples, 12, 12 is a good number. <clears throat> and you know something? Those steps haven't been seen in essence. <laughs> from the time he wrote them. Words have been changed, but not the essence. Now, I believe pretty totally, and of course I'm not a psychiatrist, and you guys can write this off, that I believe that there are two kinds of depression. There's a depression of the ego, which is for me. And there's a depression of the spirit, which is feeling of inadequacy. And it leaves you wide open for guidance and direction. And I think that's what happened to Bill. Because I believe that the 12 steps are the finest formula that was ever conceived in the mind of man through the grace of God for obtaining and maintaining strife. And I further believe that there are two other great things that happened to us. One, we 
do the thing that Claude Steps tells us to do. I think we're the finest formula for the process of self-discovery and for the good life that I've ever run into. Because, and here I will finish up with what's happened to me. I told you that I, well, I didn't tell you, but I will now. I had a fine a group of related disorders as you can have. I had really built me up a good set of related disorders. I had no home, no job, no health, no sanity, and no money. I don't think you can beat that very much. <laughs> and I've never spent five seconds on any one of them. Not five seconds. I told you I went to that first meeting by myself alone. I was comfortable there. Because I knew these monkeys were drunk and I knew they weren't drunk. Because, you see, they were still mocked up. And I was comfortable. And I was back there every night. Every night I was back there for two reasons. Number one, I was comfortable. Number two, I didn't have any place else to go. And that's a great help. So there I'm in the, in the place. Knowing that I couldn't have this thing. Wasn't any thought in my mind that I could have it for myself. Because I didn't have enough left to get it. Number one and number two, I wasn't going to live that long. But I was back there every night. And six months went by. And I made my first discovery. I discovered that I hadn't had a drink or pill for six months. And it was a discovery, just out of the blue. I haven't had a drink or a pill for six months. And I was so tickled. Then I got busy trying to give this thing away to drunk. And I got real busy and tried to do that. And another six months went by. And I made my second discovery. And that was that I had a family. And they were living like kids. They were just living like kids. And I want to make one comment on this because it's so meaningful to me. I had me a girlfriend during the early days because I didn't have any family. And uh, she was about 25 years my senior. And she was a little bitty thing. She walked like she was walking on eggs. And she was very, very wealthy. She lived up above the hotel in Beverly. I lived between Wiltshire and Olympic down on the flatland where the poor people lived. But she was wealthy. And she, uh, for some reason or another, she'd just go with me to meetings all the time. And uh, she's always dressed in God. She wore a hat. She's the only woman I think I ever saw with a hat in a, in a Amy. And she always wore a hat. And so, <clears throat> Louise, I'd call her and say, Louise, how about meeting tonight? She'd say, come get me. And I'd go get her, and away we'd go. And sometime between the first six months and the first year, she called my house thinking to get me. And she got Miss Steele on the line. And uh, Louis says, who in the hell are you? And Mrs. C says, why, I'm Chuck's wife. Louis said, didn't know he had a wife. <laughs> Just about like that. He had that kind of a voice. And Mrs. C says, well, he doesn't need it. <laughs> And I didn't. But after a year, I discovered that they had a family and they were living like kittens. And that ain't a bad discovery. And another six months went by. And I discovered I was still down in the office trying to clean up my desk. And business was good. 
business was plumb good. And another year went by, and I discovered that my state of being was better than anything I'd ever known. It was just good to breathe in and out. Beautiful. And now six years have gone by. And I discovered I was never alone anymore. I, who had walked alone for a lifetime, was never alone anymore. I had a God of my very own. And wherever I am, he is. Now, this is the great discovery. When we make this discovery, the search is over. And life begins. Fantastic thing. And it's from this experience that I have said now for the last many, many years that in my opinion, Alcoholics Anonymous is nothing in the world but uncovering, discovering, and discarding. This is the problem of Alcoholics Anonymous. We uncover and discover the thing we've been looking for all our lives. thing we've been looking for all our lives. We discover that the great cosmic joke is that God hid himself in the last place we ever looked. Right in the middle of us. And I want to tell you a little story about that. <clears throat> I'm a great lover of animals and birds and things of that kind. My family got mixed up with a bunch, a bunch of Cherokees way back down there. I'm, uh, I'm, um, I just love everything that lives, I guess. And amongst other things, I love deer very, very much. And when we moved 23 years ago from Beverly Hills to Laguna Beach, the canyon road leading into the little town was sort of a country lane. And I'd be coming home after a meeting, midnight maybe, and oftentimes I'd see as many as six or eight deer on the road. And I loved them very, very much. And every time I go through the canyon, I look for deer. And I always look for them in the last place I saw them. And I invariably see him someplace else, you know. But when I get through the cover, I quit looking for him. And maybe 15 years ago, I'm going out to the canyon and I'd had a bad night. I'd been out pretty well all night with a drunk or two. And, uh, so I was a little late going to the office. And I... Uh, probably 9.30 in the morning. I'm going out to the canyon, and I looked for deer until I got out of the cover. And I got up there where there wasn't a blade of grass to hide behind. Looked over to the left. It was the prettiest big buck you ever saw. Beautiful big fat buck standing right there with nothing to hide behind. And he said to me this. He says, you see them where they are. You don't see them where you saw them yesterday. You don't see them where you think they ought to be. You see them where they are. And before I got to Los Angeles, I'd taken that to every relationship in life. You see them where they are. And one of the most beautiful parts of it, and I hate to say this because I know there's nobody here that felt like this, but for a long part of my life, I thought that the, the epitome of perfection would be to get up in the morning and look across the breakfast table at a new beautiful lady every morning. <laughs> now, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a, a thing? Terrific. And I'm looking at what that deer just told me. And it 
said, you see them where they are? And I could see that I had been doing that. Looking across the, t- the breakfast table as a new woman. Every morning for 45 years. Because my lady isn't the same lady she was yesterday morning. She's what she was yesterday morning plus yesterday's experience in this lesson. You hear me? So she's brand new every morning. And I've had a new one ever since then. <laughs> every morning. <laughs> And uh, I took that through all the rest of the experiences in life. Now, again, to get this thing over with, let you have some fun. I beat my brains out for 30 straight years to get what I thought I was born with that. I believe I told you in the beginning, I don't know if I did or not, that I sort of grew up in this kind of country. And my family is too poor to paint, too proud to whitewash. We didn't have from nothing. And we had to get what we thought we were born without. And uh, it was necessary to get it because we didn't have it. And, of course, they read right out of the good book to me that you earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. You know, which is a good setup for salt mines. And I was on my own from 13. And from 13 to 43, I tried with everything I had to get what I thought I was born without. And they ended up at 43 without two coppers to rub together. I was conditioned to believe that we were born into this life sinners. That you didn't have to sin to go to hell. You had to get saved to keep from going to hell. Now, half my family was hard shell Baptist, and the other half was Methodist Church South. Dan Witcher's none Witcher, and I'm not opposed to either one of them. I'm not opposed to them at all. I love them. But it didn't make very good sense to me. And uh, they tried to tell us that we were sinners because of something called the original sin. And we tried to find out what that was. And somehow they wouldn't tell us. And yet what they did say about it, it seemed that it might have a little something to do with Adam rearranging Eve's leaves. (laughs) That was as kids, you know. And uh, it didn't uh, it didn't make very good sense to me, but they scared me bad enough that I tried to get saved at thirteen, and I tried hard. And when I couldn't make it, the preacher joined me, and we both prayed like hell, and nothing happened. And every once in a while he'd say to me, "How you doing?" And I'd say, "No good." So we'd start over. And pretty soon he'd get tired again. And he'd say, how you doing? No good. Finally he said to me, well, when you're baptized, it'll happen. Because he got tied out. And so when the ice went out, I went in. And he ducked me. And he brought me up and he says, how you doing? I said, no good. I'm all wet. Because that wasn't a sprinkle, that was a duck. And he says, well, when you're formally taken in church, it'll happen. And I was, and it didn't. 
And the next 30 years, I read everything in print on religion and philosophy. And I got to be very learned in religion and philosophy. I got to be known for my last 15 years of drinking as a drunken teacher. Because I saved everybody in the saloon until I fell off the bar stool and couldn't get back on it. <laughs> but I never found out why I got dipped until I got to you. And I came here not even looking for God as a soldier. Not even hoping to see him because I didn't think he liked me any better than I did. And I didn't like him at all. And I started trying to rub out a record. Now, you can't rub out a record thinking I want or don't want to like or don't like. I, 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 I. You can't do it. If you're going to rub out a record, you do something for somebody without a price tag on it. And that's what I started doing 35 years ago. And I never quit. My life has been one 12-step call for 35 years. And I'll tell you how it started and sit down. My first serious conversation after I came to was with my wife. And she was divorcing me legally, getting rid of me. And I called her in. I knew it, and it was all right. And I told her, I said, honey, it's no longer been any con concern to me whether or not I live under the truth. It is of absolutely no importance to me at all. I never ask a thing of it as long as the two of us live but one. If I have, ever have anything that will add to your life, let me give it to you. And we closed the book. And I called the boys in. And I said, boys, there's no father in the household any longer. You don't need to love me. You don't need to respect me and you don't need to obey me. I'll never ask a thing of it as long as we live but one. If ever I have anything, be it money, counsel, or blood, that'll add your life, let me give it to you. And we closed the book. And I went down to that office knowing that the man was going to throw me through the window because he sent that very definite message to the house. And I knew he was going to do it. But he paid me for something I hadn't done, and I had to go down there. And I went. And he saw my old car in the parking lot. And he knew I was on the premises, and he knew I wasn't going to stay. And he came hunting for me, and he busted in my office like a bull in a china closet. <clears throat> And I couldn't have defended myself with a shotgun because I wasn't well. In this country, they call it puny. <laughs> I was puny. I didn't have the six. I had to leap. And all I could do was sit there and say, Victor, leave me alone. I don't work for you anymore. I'm down here to clean up this desk. I'm here to do the things you paid me for last year that you didn't do. And as soon as I get even with you, I'll get the hell out of here on my own power. And you'll never owe me a penny as long as you live. But for God's sake, leave me alone. I have to get even with you. And he stopped me his tracks. And he said, what the hell's happened to you, Charlie? And I said, don't know. And I didn't. But he didn't throw me through the window. Now, quickly, when I was 11 years sober, I bought that business. And when I sold it, some 10 years ago, I was a rich man. And I never even tried to get rich. I never even thought about getting rich. I had the most fabulous business experience that anybody will ever have. And every businessman in the country would tell me if I told him what I did, 
that I was a damn liar again, but I'm not. I just helped my people do things they need to have done because I wanted to. And they kept me busy. And they made me rich. I never spent five seconds trying to get my family back. And we're a family now. Many of you know my my lady. She's a hella. She's something else, that woman. She's been an al -Anon. She started the first al thing on the coast. And then we moved down to where we are now, and she started the second one. In our living room. Both of them started in our living room. And they used my furniture until they wore it out, and then they moved out. <laughs> Never even got a dinner out of it. But she's done a beautiful job. And the kids. Something else. I shared with everybody that Dick for the first dozen years of my sobriety. And I told Dick, because Dick was born with grease paint in his ears, and I was born with a pitchfork in my hand, and I couldn't understand him. I thought I had to make a man out of it. And we fought. He was ten when I sobered up. And when he was thirty, I went to London to get acquainted with my own kid. I was sitting there one night, and it occurred to me that nobody in the whole time I'd lived in that house down there had told me what I, what I see when I look out my window. And I said to myself, why? Why hasn't somebody told me what I see when I look out of my window? Because I got the finest view in the world. You can see the China on a clear day. So, it occurred to me that the reason nobody had ever told me what I see out of my window, nobody had ever seen it. And I knew my problem with my son. You see, he's an artist, too. I got a little old painting hanging in my living room that Franklin Mint paid him $12,500 to be. It was good. But when he was in school, he was in modernistic and futuristic painting was all the rage. And he'd try to tell me the values and that stuff. And I'd take it as long as I could. And then I'd say to him, the very idea of a kid with my blood in his veins telling me that there's value in that stuff. Why well, says I have seen a better picture than that when an old cow flaps her tail up against the side of the barn. Now, that isn't a very good way to win friends and influence people. And the kid hated me. And I wasn't far from hating him because he was, just, you know, he didn't have it. I had to make a man out of it. So I said to Mrs. C, honey, we're going to London. She said, what, what are you talking about? I said, we're going to London. She said, what for? I says to meet my kid. I got to get acquainted with my kid. And I went over there. And we went to dinner. Nice place in London. And we pretty nearly got thrown out of the place. Because I started telling him about my blind spots. How I didn't know any better, you know. His second... His second major was philosophy. 
And of course, that's my middle name. <laughs> so I had torn him up. And I told him why. And I asked him to forgive me. And he did. And the dam went out. And we've had a fantastic, fantastic relationship ever since. We went out and after that thing was over and got a car and drove all over the Alps. And had a picnic, you know. And the kid had hated me and I just uh, close to hated him. So, the boys would like to come home and sit there. And, visit. and of course, since I quit going any place, I've been all over the world. So I have to believe that St. Francis knew what he was talking about. And I don't believe it because he said it. I believe it because it happened to me. I'm totally convinced that the first two words of the Lord's Prayer mean what they say. Our Father God. Remember when they said the carpenter man, Master teaches to pray. He said, after this manner, pray ye, our Father. As far as I know, that means his Father, your Father, and mine. And I believe it does. And I believe that's the way it is. I believe that's the way it is. A good book, you know, says God is life. And you and I are alive. So God must be that which we are. The very translation of the word from Hebrew to English, it means God is that which is. And I believe that's the way it is. God is that which is. Now, I further believe that the gift of God was made the foundation of the earth. He gave us the universe and himself. It's the foundation of the earth, and he's always known that. He has never been confused. He's always known that. But you see, you and I have to discover it for ourselves. We have to discover it for ourselves. And it's a process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. And we uncover and discover the thing we've been looking for all our lives. A God of my very own, wherever I am, he is. And this is a fantastic way to go. Fantastic way to go. Had you asked me the first six years why I did what I did, I would say, to rub out a record. If you had asked me after the first six years, I would say to help God's kids do things they need to have done because I won't do and that's all I've done. And I've had one of the most fantastic lives that anybody's ever lived. And I take absolutely no credit for it. I take credit for the first 43 years where I was the master of ceremonies and the star of the show. And I ended up a failure as a husband, a father, a businessman, a man, and a drunk. For that I take credit. For this, I take absolutely no credit at all. This, by the grace of God, through the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, and through people like you. And I'm totally convinced that the only motivation in life that's worth its salt is the word that I've heard you people use a number of times this weekend. Can you talk? It's a little four-letter word. L-O-V-E, love. That's the only motivation that's worth a damn in the whole experience of living. 
You do it for free and for fun. Because you love it. And you find that the gift has always been you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.